So we're talking about the uh, living a Jesus-built life. We've talked about the Jesus-built church, and I'm talking about the church is made up of people. And if we're going to have a Jesus-built church, we are going to have to be a Jesus-built built people. We're going to have to have him building in our lives. And uh, last time we talked about the, the Jesus-built church model that I'm trying to apply to our lives, uh, which starts with the Great Confession, where uh, the disciples, we looked at this last time, the disciples, uh, especially Peter, who spoken for the disciples, made a great confession that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And last time, we, we, we zeroed in on who Jesus is, what Jesus did, and what Jesus has. Did anybody memorize that this week, like I asked you to? All right. All right. These are my star pupils. Hallelujah. Woo! Yeah. And... Uh, so, and then we got verses to go with them. Who Jesus is, right? John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1.14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Yes, good. And uh, so that, that nails down who He is. I think for what He did, I had uh, John 1.29, right? Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Okay, I know... King James, so it might be a little different than what you memorized it in. I memorized that a long time ago. And what Jesus has. And at that point, I believe I just gave you, did I give you just John 3.16? I forgot John what the, the assignment was. The world that came from the Pardon? John 3.16. Yep, what he has. He's got eternal life. Okay. And uh, we're going to build on that, not so much tonight, but next week. We're going to build on those. So if you haven't done your memorization assignments from the last time, you get this week to work on them too. <laughs> and it'll all come together next time. Next time is going to be really a lot of fun, okay? It's going to be a lot, really a lot of fun. And uh, so, uh, I want to focus tonight on the Great Commandment. Of course, I didn't put on here the, the Great Commission. That will be next time. But uh, the Great Commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, okay? And then it says to, to love your neighbor as yourself. And so, we're going to focus on that tonight. And so, the Great Commandment, uh, the teacher, uh, I mean, they came to Jesus, the teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Okay. And the question then is, what does it mean to love the Lord? That's a good question. Come on. What does it mean to love the Lord? Who's say, I got, I got a workbook. I'm done with my last one. Here you go. Who's, who's going to write? Who's the writer? Yes, I am. Yeah. <laughs> All right. What does it mean to <laughs> love you. the Lord is our question. And uh, I want to suggest, okay, you probably find a lot of different meanings and things, but I want to suggest it means to offer sacrificial worship service. Worship slash service. Your, your, your worship is a service, and your service is worship. But it's to offer sacrificial worship. And the way I get this is from a very interesting verse in the Bible, Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. All right? Jesus loves the church. And so he models it for us what it means to love. And here's where it is. He gave himself. When he gave himself, that was a sacrifice. He was willing to sacrifice. So I'm going to suggest that worship involves a sacrifice. Worship for you involves a sacrifice. We're going to talk about that tonight. Then. On Sunday morning when we come to the service, we're really coming to offer a sacrifice. And we're going to find out what sacrifice we're offering even today in worship. And I'm going to take you kind of a long path to get there. But I think it will all unfold and you'll grab hold of it and say, wow, this blows my mind. Okay, I want to talk about the to offer sacrificial worship. I want to talk about worship. The first occurrence of the word worship in the Bible, and I left it off of here, <laughs> okay? It's in Genesis 22, 5. So you write that down somewhere, Genesis 22, 5. I mean, in the story of Abraham, Abraham was told by God his faith was being tested. And, and God tested Abraham's faith and said, go to Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah is where the Dome of the Rock sits in Jerusalem today. Okay? The temple used to be there prior to that. David put the temple there. Okay? Or Solomon actually did. But he's picked the spot. Before that, Abraham took his son, um, Isaac, 
to that place because God said, take your son. He says in verse 2, take your son, your only son, whom you love, and go to the region of Mount Moriah, okay? And, and in this passage, in, in verse 5 is where it says, he says, I, his servant then says, uh, okay, I see you've got the wood, I see you've got, uh, you know, uh, the fire, I see you've got everything, uh, where is the sacrifice? Yeah. And Isaac's the sacrifice. But before that, he says, to the servant that's standing there tending to the donkey and all the other things because it's just the truth he says the lad and i this is king james the lad and i will go yonder and worship <coughs> he knows full well he is going to sacrifice take your only son and you're going to take him and you're going to offer him as a sacrifice and abraham for the first time in the bible where worship is used he says i'm going to go sacrifice my son worship involves sacrifice a loving sacrifice it's the one whom you love he says sacrifice him there uh in, in the second verse uh there's our key word sacrifice because that's that's what is involved in worship there's a sacrifice sacrifice him there is a burnt offering i don't have that highlighted but i want you to just note that burnt offering a burnt offering because we're going to talk about burnt offering a little while uh, in the hebrew it's a hola offering hola hola we get the word holocaust from that. Holocaust. A holocaust is totally consumed. All right? So he says there, offer him. You're going to totally annihilate him. That, that's the whole idea of, of this sacrifice. You're totally giving him totally to God, and he's going to be totally no longer yours. Uh, offer him there as a burnt offering on the mountain that I will tell you about. And, and so it says here that he sacrifices there as a burnt offering. I know ahead of myself. This is your priestly service, is that... You're going to give something to God that you're not getting back. Okay? It's wholly devoted over to God. You're giving it to God, and you're, you're not taking it back. On one of the mountains that I will tell you about, so then he took him, and he took a knife to slay his son. And you know the story. As he was about to slay his son, all familiar with the story? The angel stopped him. Okay? And I said, but the angel of the Lord... And the angel of the Lord is a, a, a theophany. It's a manifestation of God. When you see the term angel of the Lord, all caps, it's a theophany. God was there. God stops it because we know there are places in the Bible where it says angel of the Lord. It was God that was speaking. God calls out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. And he says, here I am. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, oh, your only son. Uh, does he have another son? Yes. Oh, see, this is where that last time, monogenes, we talked about that last time, only begotten son. This It means unique. Because he already had another son, he's saying, your unique son. The uniqueness of this son is that he is the one through whom the promise of salvation is going to come. And so he's telling him, sacrifice the son of salvation. Okay? It's, it's a picture of Jesus. But he stops him, you know, see, with the, and he doesn't do it. And instead, I don't know if I got the next slide here. Okay. Then, but instead, there is a ram caught in the thicket. See the ram? And, and, and he starts making noise, and God directs him to that. And instead, the ram takes the place of Isaac. So we got substitution involved here, a whole idea uh, going on here. But in this whole passage, all this is going on is called worship. Do you notice what's missing in worship? Singing! <laughs> Isn't that amazing? The Bible starts off, singing is not worship. Oh, or later it's going to come in as worship. But the primary thing about worship is not about singing a good song service. The thing about worship is what you bring of yourself. We'll see that as we go along. Okay. Worship involves offering a priestly prescribed sacrifice. That's exactly what Abraham was doing. He was the, 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 the patriarchal priest of the family. He was offering a sacrifice. God had called for his son. God substituted the ram instead of his son. But he still offers the sacrifice. And uh, it's a, the worship involves a priestly prescribed sacrifice. When I go to the book of Leviticus, when we actually get Moses receiving from God what the offerings are all about, Okay, and he prescribes through Aaron. You know, the Aaron would be the high priest, and that his descendants would be the priests. 
that uh, they would have a, a priestly system where you could approach God and worship Him with an offering. The first chapter tells us there are six phases to offering a sacrifice. I call the six phases to worshiping God. Right? Because this is how you approach God. First of all, there's a presentation. And I notice here, and, I, and this is out of the New English Translation. When someone among you presents an offering to the Lord, you must present your offering from the domesticated animals, either from the herd or, or from the flock. The first key word I want is present. There is a presentation. If you wanted to offer a sacrifice in the Old Testament times, and you would take and you'd find either the lamb or whatever it was that you're going to offer that was prescribed, and you would bring it, and you would present it at the gate of the tabernacle to the priest. You'd say, this is it. He would check it over to make sure it was out flaw and that it was qualified and could suit, be suitable uh, offering. And so the first thing you do is you present your offering uh, in Leviticus. The second part is that then you make identification. He is to lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering. The, this is a burnt offering. It's a whole offering. It's total is going to be uh, consumed. He, he says, you put your hand on top of it. I call this identification. Because what you're doing is you're identifying with the victim. It's kind of like uh, I, I am identifying. Christ is my Savior. And, and I am identifying with Jesus. They were identifying with this lamb by laying their hand on it. And uh, they were saying that this lamb and I, he's like taking my guilt, my wrong, my sin, and, and lay your hand on the burnt offering and it will be accepted on his behalf. It's a substitute. That's what Jesus was, the Lamb of God, the sin of the world. So when I accepted Jesus, kind of like I laid my hand on him and he became my substitute. And so you lay your hand on, on it and it, to make an atonement for him. The, the word atonement, you can see it there, it's at one met. It's to be at one. I am not at one with God prior to coming to the Lord, okay? But when I come to the Lord, then I'm at one with him. That's atonement. It brings me at one. It brings me peace and, and all that. So there's this identification. First is a presentation. I find a flawless animal in, in my flock. I present the animal. Then I, when the priest is there, I lay my hand on its head and I identified with them. The next part of the process you find in Leviticus is that you kill, you slaughter, depends which translation you use, uh, the, the animal. Then he shall kill the bull, in this case it was from the flock, before the Lord. And you, you kill your sacrifice. You put it to death. Don't forget, you've identified yourself with that. You're putting yourself to death. Isn't that amazing? Worship is about putting myself to death and letting the resurrection life of Jesus Christ flow through me. It's not about me. It's all about Him when I come into worship. Okay? So then He shall kill the bull. So I've got to put to death the old me. The next part is where the priest steps in. Up to this point, you've been doing it all. Now you have a mediator that steps in. The mediator is the priest. And the Aaron's sons, the priest, they shall bring the blood from the lamb. They, they catch that in a bowl when it's killed. And, and then they take it and they put it on the sides. Pretty much translation, on the horns of the altar, on the sides. And they sprinkle it around the base of the altar. And uh, the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. And the priest is the mediator that mediates and does this. Isn't it interesting that we have, in the Bible, the New Testament says that we have, there's, one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. He is both the priest and the sacrifice at the same time. Because he's the Lamb of God, but he mediates his own blood in our behalf for forgiveness of sins. But at this point, the priest takes over in the process. Then we have expiation, the removal of your guilt and your sin. He said, you then shall flay the burnt offering and the sons of Aaron, the priests, uh, and the priest shall burn all of it on the altar. That's where it is a whole, this one is a burnt offering. And by burnt, it means the, the whole offering, the whole thing. Now, now, there's other kinds of offering. There's a peace offering, the menka offering. There's a trespass offering, the asa offering. There's, there's all these different kinds of offerings, but he, he focuses at the very beginning on uh, the one that has to do with the transference of our sin and, and totally taking it away because it's all consumed on the altar. And he says, uh, the food, he says, 
burn it all on the altar as a burnt offering. A food offering uh, with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. The Lord is pleased uh, when this offering takes place. There's a food offering also that he includes here at the very beginning. The last part I call participation. Certain of the offerings, the priests who mediate it all shall eat thereof. Aaron and his son shall eat what is left over from it. Sometimes portions were cut out and left to the side because that was the priest's portion. Uh, he was supposed to get a, a, a part of the, you know, if you, in the New Testament, the principle here is you preach the gospel, you live by the gospel. Okay? And, and so what we have here is the full, full part. And then this, the rest of Leviticus, the first like 10 chapters, they go over all the different kinds of offerings based upon this model. Okay? And this, I want to suggest, is the model for worship approaching God, both in the Old Testament and the Old and the New. In the Old Testament, they had a priesthood. Okay? They had a priesthood. The priesthood is theirs as an everlasting ordinance. So the Old Testament believer, uh, he wants to go into the presence of God. He would go and he'd do all of that. He'd make the presentation, lay his hand on it, he'd kill the, the, the victim, and, and then the priest would take over, he'd sprinkle all the blood around, he'd put it on, fire it up, and, and burn it all up. If there was a portion that was supposed to be for him, he'd partake of it. And, and the priest is the one, okay, who actually takes you to God, who takes you to God in the Old Testament. You couldn't just go to God because there was a, a priest that you had to use. He was your go-between. And we have a go-between for our Father. It, it's, you see, in the Old Testament, they had a priesthood. And, and the priesthood, they, they could only... You see, God would be in, his, in, the, in the tabernacle or the temple. And He would manifest His presence there with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire that He was inside. And, and He was inside in the center of all the, the tribes of Israel were around Him. And if a person wanted to come, they would come to the gate, and there they would present the offering, lay their hand on the offering, kill the offering. And then the priest would take over. He'd put it on, on, on the altar, and he would do it all. Priests, the, the, the everyday priest, you know, the common everyday priest, they would take over here, and then they could go as far as, hey, they, they could ceremonially wash the offering to put it on. Or they could go into the holy chamber, and, and they had certain routines they had to do with the lampstand. Uh, with the altar of incense and the table of showbread. That's as far as they could go. But one time a year, the high priest and him only, one time a year, one day, Day of Atonement, he could go further than the Old Testament believer, the Old Testament priest. He was the high priest. He could go into the Holy of Holies, into the very inner chamber where the Shekinah glory of God shone, where God was manifesting His presence, and there he would take the blood from the sacrifice and he would carry it in and he would sprinkle it on the mercy seat. We talked about that last week, remember? And in the mercy seat was the lid on the Ark of the Covenant. Inside the covenant were the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments that the whole nation had broken and he would sprinkle the blood on there and it would be an atonement, a covering for the people's sin. But Jesus has passed through the heavens as our high priest, and he has sprinkled his own blood on the heavenly mercy seat. And, and he has done more than just covered our sins. The New Testament says he has taken them away. He's taken them away. They had a priesthood. In the New Testament, we are a priesthood. I'm a priest. You're a priest. And it's funny, when I was pastoring in Philadelphia, I was driving the church van, picking up kids for vacation Bible school. And a little guy got on, and he said, are you a priest? And so I said, yeah. He said, well, where's your collar? I said, oh, no. I said, I said, at our church, all the members are priests. He looked at me. Everybody's a priest? I said, yep, everybody's a priest. Because, you see, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, he has made us to be a kingdom of priests. I'm a priest. You're a priest. You can call me Priest Dennis, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Priestess Diane. I don't know. <laughs> We're all priests. Notice, priest to serve his 
Father. You see, Jesus has made us a kingdom of priests and servants. But you are a chosen people. God chose you to be a royal priesthood. The word royal is kingly. kingly. I, I, I have become a child of God. That makes me royalty, folks. <laughs> I mean, you can't get any higher than that. I am a child of God, and I am a priest. I don't have a priesthood. That's why we don't have a confessional booth here because you don't have to come to me and confess your sin so that I can take it to God. You can pray directly to God as a believer priest, you see. You can approach God yourself. That doesn't mean that you don't ask me to pray so that together we pray so that I can intercede on your behalf and I can mediate on your behalf too. But you don't, you don't need me. You can go directly to God. This is beautiful. We are a priesthood. This is so important. We are a priesthood and have direct access to God for we have a great high priest, it says in Hebrews chapter 4 who has gone through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, so Jesus has gone into heaven, let us approach the throne of grace. That's where he's seated. The right hand of the Father. We approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in the time of need. Do you know what to say? When you're tempted, prior to this, the Lord tempted, he was tempted at all points like we, uh, yet without sin. And here then he says, we have this high priest, he's gone into heaven. When you're tempted, as a priest, you just go right to God. You go to Jesus and say, Jesus, help! Help! You know the shortest prayer in the Bible? Anybody know the shortest prayer in the Bible? Jesus what? That's the shortest verse. The shortest oh. prayer. Oh. Peter was walking down the water. Yeah. Yeah. And he started to sink and he help said, me. Lord, help. Shortest verse in the Bible. Uh, shortest prayer in the Bible. Right? Lord, help. Did he help? Immediately. Yeah. <laughs> We have direct access to God, all right? And worship is about coming into the presence of God. You can worship at home. We collectively worship here at the church. We are priesthood who, are, uh, who have a priestly sacrifice, uh, a worship service to perform. Because I'm a priest and I have a sacrificial worship service to perform, uh, one of them is presentation, just like the Old Testament. Notice what it says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present. I make a presentation. I come to church here, and we're gathering together for corporate worship. I'm coming into the sanctuary, and I'm coming to present myself before God. Okay. To present identification. I want you to know what I'm presenting. I'm presenting myself, Lord. It'd be good if you just laid your hand on your head when you came in. You know, <laughs> you know like you would, would, they, they did the animal. I, it's just kind of a symbolic, you know, Lord, I'm coming to present me. I'm presenting myself in worship. All right. There's identification. Uh, he goes on here. As a living sacrifice. You say, well, wait a minute. I thought you said, uh, you know, the, the part was execution. Yeah. I bring myself in alive. Do you know they brought every sacrifice alive? You couldn't bring a dead animal to be sacrificed. No, no. It was, it was already dead. You had to bring a live one. So back then, when he presented the offering, you know, it was alive. He executed it. And there's a sense in which I have to execute my will. And I come in and I'm saying, God, for this hour, it's not about me. My focus is on you. You know, when you got a focus like that, you don't care about the temperature. Oh, it's too hot in there. Who cares? Too cold. We don't care if it's too loud, too too quiet. We don't care. Execution. I've come presenting myself that it's not about me, Lord. It's about you. I'm here to worship you. The next part is mediation. This is your spiritual worship. You do this. We try to lead in worship. You know? I, you know, somebody said you're going to lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. 
We could lead you and try to create an atmosphere of worship, but I cannot make you connect with God. That's what you, that, that's your spiritual worship. You have to mediate. You have to do that. You have to prepare your heart. You have to prepare your mind. You have to do that. Mediation. The next part is expiation. God says this is uh, acceptable to Him. When you do this and you put yourself to death and you're doing a spiritual worship, it expiates. And He finds this acceptable and, and a pleasing sacrifice. The final part is, comes in the next verse, is participation. Verse 2 of Romans chapter 12 says this, Do not be conformed. Conform means to be pushed into the mold. Any of you have ever had those jello molds? <laughs> yeah. You know, you, you, you got the jello mold, you pour the, the jello in it, and when it cools, it takes on the shape. This is exactly what the verse says, all right? When I participate in genuine worship, I do not conform to the world. Amen. I don't conform to this world. But I am transformed, just like that. I've just been poured into the mold of Jesus Christ. And so when I come out, I should be more like Jesus and less like me from a worship experience. I'm more like Jesus. I've been transformed. I like this word transform. You ever seen a caterpillar? You know, uh, and then he goes into the phase of cocoon, and then he comes out as a butterfly. That's called metamorphosis. That's a Greek word here. <coughs> when I go into genuine worship with God, all right, I am going through a process of metamorphosis because I am dying. I'm executing myself, and He is putting resurrection life in me. I come out with newness of life. And this whole process of worship is renewing that process that happened the day I got saved. The day I got saved, I was excited. I was so excited. I went and bought a postcard, wrote home to my mom. Dear mom, yesterday I shot guns. I got 17 points. I was at camp. I'll write a letter later this week, I wrote. And then I said, yesterday I got staved. I didn't even know how to spell saved. <laughs> I got staved. I, my life was transforming. I was already in the transformation process. I was excited. When you do genuine worship, you come away saying, you know, I met with God, God met with me. I, 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 I'm more like Jesus coming out of this. Okay? Be transformed, metamorphosed. You're changed by the renewing of your mind. The mind, oh, the mind is crucial in your spiritual journey. It says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So the more I, I can focus and worship on the Lord and less about me, the more I'm going to be transformed. He says that you may, you, he says that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God. Uh, this is, uh, I forgot what translation this is from, but it's by putting things to test, you will know what God wants you to do. Why? Because you're going to have the mind of Christ. Isn't that what it says in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the last verse? It says, but we have the mind of Christ. The problem is we don't use the mind of Christ. We're so consumed with ourselves rather than saying, put myself to death. Jesus said it this way, take up your cross and follow me. You know, taking up a cross meant I'm going on a death march. Because the end of where you go with the cross is Golgotha. What you do with the, with the cross, you lay down on it. What they do is they nail you there, you're lifted up, you put yourself to death. That's what he said, take up your cross and follow me. And the same thing is going here. Don't be, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed so you might discern what the will of God is. I got some discussion questions for 10 minutes. Oh, I'm right at target. <laughs> you guys all know I'm a clock watcher, so. <laughs> I suggested here, and I, I know this to be true, the first occurrence of the word worship is found in the story of Abraham offering up his son Isaac. I have suggested that all worship involves a sacrifice or an offering. How does that differ from the way we use worship today? Any thoughts? How do we use the word worship today? I'm saying, hey, worship involves a sacrifice. How do we use the word worship today? Praise songs. Praise songs. What else? Prayer. Prayer. Mm -hmm. What else? Hmm? Giving. Giving, okay. What else? Community. Or saint. No. Yeah, a worship community. Okay, what else? Teaching. Teaching? Yeah, teaching. Okay, these are all good. These are all good. <coughs> what else? Loving. Loving, okay. Each other. Oh, this is great. This is good. Good, good. Fellowship. 
fellowshipping, all these things are going to come into play. I think that another aspect that maybe not is one that we should be proud of. We tend to see it as a passive thing. You know, we come to have this done to us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We come to have it done to us. A great worship is experience is when they have performed well. <laughs> Come as a spectator. A spectator sport. Right. We're all in the grandstands cheering on, you know, but not the lions, but we're cheering on. <laughs> yeah. you, know? yeah. you don't want to do that, not in Rome. They didn't you want because it was the Christians in there, okay? With the lions. <laughs> right. You're cheering. What, you, you, Someone once said that you don't go to church just for yourself, but the person next to you in the pew. Oh. You couldn't hear that. Session. Comes, yeah. Yes. But you don't go to church just for yourself. You come for the, the others that are there with you. Yeah. How many, I think that's my next question. How might this idea of worship involving a sacrifice relate, though, to today? Anybody ever thought, well, I'm going to church and bring a sacrifice? That's kind of foreign to us, the whole idea of worship, isn't it? That I'm going to go there to offer a sacrifice of something to God. That's kind of foreign to us. Um, I think that's at the core of it. And it, what, it's like Roger said, I go passively expecting to get something from it. And then what way I go? Rather than going actively, what can I contribute to it? Okay. And, and I, I think there's a huge difference there. Anybody need a break here? Your time is up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> break time is over. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the great commandment. I want to talk about this. As a believer priest, every one of us is a believer priest if we know Jesus Christ as our Savior. We're a believer priest. It is our spiritual act of worship to offer our bodies. Offer my body. How many enjoyed the song today, I Surrender All? Oh, I love that. <laughs> is that great today, I Surrender All? All right. Now, we, we sang that, but if you could sometimes just close your eyes and get rid of all the other people around you, that is like a prayer, okay? That I am surrendering all to be the living sacrifice. I'm putting an end to everything so that it's all about you, all about you. And that's worship, and that, that's the starting point. I can offer my body all right, as a living sacrifice unto the Lord. The second thing I want to point out is in Philippians 4, 14 through 19, I offer my money. All right, everybody grab your wallet. Oh, the preacher's going nowhere. I don't want him to go. <laughs> Paul says, I am amply supplied. God provides everything I need. And now that I have received the gifts you sent to me, did you know that the book of Philippians, where I'm taking this from, is actually just a thank you note to the church at Philippi because they sent missionary money support to him. And as the missionary, he's sending back this letter to say thank you. And this is where he says, I am amply supplied, and now I have now that I have received the gifts you sent to me, you sent them to me. He said they are watch this a fragrant offering. It's like when they when uh, they you made an offering to the Lord, and you burn it, and there's a smell going up. Now, if you ever smell um, a good steak burning, <laughs> you know while it's cooking, it smells good, but then it starts burning. All right, it's a fragrant smell. Notice what he says. An acceptable sacrifice. I suggest the most active part of our worship service that most of you do, and you don't even realize it, that you're doing as a believer priest, is when the offering plate goes by and you put your offering in. Because you actively did that. We didn't coerce you, did we didn't force you. We don't tell heart-pulling stories of how for you to give. It's just... It, it, it's. What God puts on your heart, and you actively do that. It, it, it may be the most worshipful thing you do on a Sunday morning. I take and give an offering to the Lord. 
And he listen when he goes on, he says, And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Now I've preached whole sermons on this, so don't get me sidetracked here. <laughs> <laughs> all right. This is if you meet this condition, you will get this result. People will claim this, my God will supply all your needs according to riches and glory, but they don't take, they pull it out of context. When you are worshiping the Lord with your offering, you know, in the Old Testament, when is a tithe, that's why I got for my tithe, 10%. 10% of my income, when I'm offering that to the Lord, they sent a gift to Apostle Paul, and I don't know, it doesn't say it was a tithe, but they sent this, the love gift. He says, I will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. And uh, it doesn't say meet his needs out of his riches like you could exhaust them, but according to his riches. Right? They are never exhausted. God owns everything. Years ago at Dallas Theological Seminary, the, uh, they were having real hard times. Just a long time ago, they were having time, hard times financially. Couldn't quite make it. Had a visiting preacher in who was on the board. Visiting preacher got up and prayed prayer. And some of you will know this song. He took it from the line in the song. Lord, we know that you own the cattle on a thousand hills. Could you please sell, sell some of them and send the money to the seminary? <laughs> <laughs> See, you had the right attitude. God owns everything. We have a need. We're trying to serve you. Meet the need. That's the whole idea behind the, the whole Jesus built church and built life. Is it's all about Him. I believe Jesus will build this church. I believe He will. He didn't say, I will bury my church. I, I, don't, I don't think any church should be dying. But churches should be dynamically growing. And part of that is, we have to have this kind of experience. Okay, real worship. The younger generation wants to see genuine Christianity. They want to see it real. They don't want to see the phony, fake stuff. They, they want to see genuine people doing genuine Christianity, and that is very attractive to them. And, and I think if we do that, we become a real Jesus-built church, a Jesus-built people, that God will build. Jesus will build this church, and it will, it will grow. The third one is we offer our praise. Because that's what somebody said earlier, you know, we do praise, we do worship, we do sing, we do all these, we do give our offerings. And, and this is all genuine worship. Why? Because I love the Lord God with all my heart. My love is because I sacrifice. I sacrifice as a believer priest. And part of my, one of the ways that I, I make an offering is I praise the Lord. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. Now, if I were to uh, say that my wife is the greatest homemaker in the whole world. Alright? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say you might give him a really nice meal. <laughs> but you'd say I'm bragging on my wife. Right? No. Say so you mm -hmm. love your wife. I love my wife. You know that you better be good to her. <laughs> yeah. I love her and I'm speaking kindly and good of her. I'm praising her. Now, if I were to go around and say, I am the best chef in the whole church, what would that be? I'd argue you. <laughs> My grandmother's got to be. <laughs> I'd say that's arrogant. Arrogant and bragging. Okay. Yeah. But when I focus it on someone else, okay, we call that praising. For me, to brag about God, that is praise. That's, that, that's what praise is, bragging about God. Anytime, I, I can tell, I tell to somebody and I brag about who, who Jesus is, what he did, what he has, those things I talked about last week. Anytime I do that, I'm praising God. And we call it praise music, okay? Because of praise music, I'm supposed to be singing it about God. But I think it goes beyond just singing. I think I talk about talking about God. I, I praise God. And, and when, I, when I brag about God, that is a sacrifice of praise. Sacrifice of praise. Remember the old days we had testimony service? Anybody remember testimony? Or people get up and tell testimony? We used to do this every year at uh, when I was pastoring in Ohio. Uh, we got together the churches in the, the group of churches we were with, the, the regular Baptists, and 
there were like three or four of us churches. We always met at the same church because it was the largest that could seat everybody. And uh, on, it was the, the Wednesday night before Thanksgiving. And they would ask for testimonies. And uh, the, the, the guy that was moderating, we were the smallest church there. Okay, the other ones were larger churches. And they'd ask for a testimony. And, a, and when a person got up and gave a testimony, then they asked, well, what church are you from? <laughs> and every single one that got up, I was getting embarrassing because they were all from my church. <laughs> I've got like nobody else's people. We're very thankful on the, on the verge of Thanksgiving. But we were accustomed to bragging about God. That's, that's what church is. You know, I come in, I, you know, I can brag about the Lions and I can brag about, uh, you know, uh, University of Michigan or I can brag about, you, you can Michigan brag about State. whatever team you're favorite. <laughs> you, you, know, you can brag about them. But when we come to church, it's really, I'm bragging about God. We should have God talk. I call it God talk. Jesus talk. We should be talking about Jesus, what Jesus did in our lives. You see, when young people who don't know Christ, they come in here and they say, then nobody talks about Jesus but the guy that stands up front. How, how is this Jesus relevant to their life? Once a week they come and hear a lecture about Jesus? They want to at the coffee tables. Oh, you, I shared my faith with this guy at work. Hey, you know, I prayed. Uh, I was praying for my neighbor, you know, because this happened and, and God answered my prayer. When they start hearing this, you know what they say? They say, this people really knows God. But if we don't do God talk, when I don't brag about God, I'm not making a sacrifice of praise and nobody's hearing it. Okay? And, and so that's, that is, that's what worship is about. It's about praising God. The fourth thing is in the same verse. Okay? And do not forget to do good uh, deeds or good things for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Good deeds. I am. I, I'm really thrilled about uh, the way the guys have helped Monica Combs. Okay, and she expressed that this morning, so I'm not saying anything out of out of order here. Uh, that the guys here have, you know, she had a need, and they've gone to bat, they you know mowed the lawns to help her move stuff, and all of that, because they are sacrifices that God is pleased with. God is pleased. With. Our faith, our worship, it is to be a sacrifice on my part. Um, often I, I've got to take a hit, okay? Sometimes it's financial, sometimes it's my time. Some, in order to do the good deed, in order to please God, because it's not about me. Third one is our stuff, my possessions. That same verse. And do not forget to do good and to share with others. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Most of us got our stuff all locked up. We sure don't want anybody to get it. You know? Um, what if we really viewed everything that I owned, that I was just a steward, and that nothing really belonged to me? That it all belonged to God. My house is not my house. It's the house that I'm a steward of that God provided for me. And maybe I'd open my doors a little bit more to people who are in need. Okay? Maybe I'd just be simple, like in the Bible says, be hospitable and invite people into my home. And I'd do, I'd do some Jesus talk. Whoa, because it's my home, it's my turf. I talk whatever I want to talk about in my house. Right? And I started doing Jesus talk. You see, see how all these all link together? Um, worship. It's about even using my stuff, the stuff I have for God. People say, it would be nice if the church had a bus. I'm thinking it would be nice if we all just used our cars. <laughs> well, we all load up our car every week. And bring, don't come with an empty car. Come, come loaded with other people. You say, well, where am I going to get them? Well, if you start inviting, they'll start getting in your car and coming. I say, I'll pick you up. I'll take you out for lunch afterward. You see what I'm saying? All of this, all of this is... This is a sacrifice. Does it cost me something? Yeah, if I pick up somebody's lunch, that costs me something, right? I, I'm sacrificing. And, and this is worship I, I, of my possessions. Hey. Oh, I'm in great shape. <laughs> yeah, some discussion questions. Have you ever considered yourself to be a priest? No. You, mm. Pardon? No. Somebody say yes? How much time, Mom? <laughs> If so, what brought you to that conclusion? <clears throat> you guys are all quiet. 
Right. I never expect, I never consider a priest, I mean, yes, I've witnessed others, but I never, I guess because I was Catholic, brought up Catholic, okay, okay for 18 yes. years of my life. And then I was I was watching those verses, and, and that's probably where they got their priests, mm -hmm. and then they got their pope. Yeah. I mean, and I shouldn't say their, because it, they still believe in God. Okay, yes. but, but I can look at that, that's my past upbringing to now, so I never considered myself a priest. Isn't that amazing? To... <laughs> it's kind of a troubling thought, actually. Yeah. <laughs> but but I, you yeah. can go directly to God on your own. That's, yeah, that's... The one. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? I can go into the presence of God on my own. Sometimes I, I, when I pray, I try to just imagine. I close my eyes. I have to close my eyes to do this imagination thing. I close my eyes and I imagine I've just been transported to heaven. And I'm on, I got this imagery in my mind, I'm on royal red carpets. You can pick whatever color, maybe purple's your favorite. I don't know. And I'm on these carpets and I'm on my knees before God. And Christ is there as my mediator on the throne. And it says he's at the right hand of the Father, so the Father's there and he's on the throne. And I'm praying to Jesus. Well, I'm actually praying to God, but Jesus is kind of making the sense out of the nonsense I'm praying. Does that make sense? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I just, I, I, I go through that. Because I... Somehow, when I, I just, I often, I'll, I'll even articulate, Lord, I don't know how it is that I close my eyes and I am transported from here to heaven and I'm right before you. But I'll tell you, it makes a big difference in the way you pray. That you're right in the presence of God. And that's what that verse said. He bolts us to come, he asks us to come boldly into the throne of grace and, and talk to him. Right? Oh, the question you asked about, you know, uh, considering yourself a priest, well, the Protestant uh, theology is the priesthood of all believers. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is something that, that I've always felt, you know, comfortable with, that, that, you know, every Christian would be in that category. Yeah. How many others have come? Go ahead. I was going to say, just so to, because I was raised Catholic mm -hmm. too, so oh, okay. priest to us meant something yeah. totally priest. different. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that also meant that we couldn't even read the Bible for years. Uh, only the priest could and interpret it for us. But so everybody here that was non-Catholic growing up, <laughs> did you always believe that? That's the first time I've heard that. Not really. Not really? really? Did you hear that? Have you ever thought you about you myself as somebody? The closest I would have got was, you know, a witness. Yeah, not, same here. You know. Really? Yeah. Okay. When you grasp all of this, you realize that we're gonna, the, the job of a priest is to take people to God. As a believer priest, I don't take other believers there. I can. I mean, I can. But I take the world there. And so my, I, I, am, I am their link to God. And if I don't represent him, how are they going to get to God? You see, I'm, I am the priest to the, to the whole world. Now, in Israel, the priest was only to their nation. I am now, as a believer priest, I am the representative for all people. So I, I am in this business of trying to bring up people to God. Okay. I have another question here. Okay. Which of the believer priest's acts of worship is the easiest and hardest for you? Somebody would probably say, I never considered these, but okay. <clears throat> In that case, which do you think would be the easiest or the hardest for you? Offering your body completely to the Lord? Offering your money? God, I'll even give you 10% from the top. My praise, talking and praising God. Uh, my deeds, doing good things. Uh, using all my stuff, my assets for God. Which would be the easiest and hardest in your mind? I'll give you a minute to think on that. Are we answering this? Yeah. Just <laughs> throw out your answer. <laughs> Nobody's been bold yeah, enough yet to do it. The hardest one for me would be my body, and uh, B would be the money for the easiest. Okay. Somebody else? I don't think they'll all be the same. Person. I was thinking 
giving up of my body because I regularly I think I do the others. I mean, when the stuff, I mean, I can relate to either in classroom as a teacher, I have to be careful at school not to tread on the rest of the world and ethnicity's beliefs because my belief in God comes through an awful lot in the glass just blah, automatically. Okay. Um, so, and giving them my stuff, I mean, they use all my tools and, you know, so I give up that stuff, but giving up my body completely, I guess, is I think, I don't think I understand exactly what it means to give up my body altogether. Sounds immoral to me. <laughs> yes, sir. For me, the easiest um, would be phrase. Hardest would be stuff. Stuff. And I think if we all think really hard about it, right, it's going to be tough for a lot of us. The stuff. The stuff. That would be I work oh. hard for my stuff. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Americans have a lot of stuff. stuff. Yeah. But it's just I, stuff. Yeah. Our culture. <laughs> We are judged by class, by our stuff. 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 <laughs> Money and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. What were you going to say? I was going to say exactly the same thing. Praises would be the easiest for me. Stuff, and sometimes, and you know, we don't have that much stuff. Al and I really don't have that much stuff. But I grew up with, you worked hard for your stuff. Yeah. And so, you know, it's hard to, to think, oh, wait a minute, I worked really hard for that. It's not mine, you know. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 we, I just have to. We, we let get go it, more. but we don't. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. you get it. We get it, but we don't. Yeah. You know. We get exactly. Well, we're of an age where we did temporary. work really hard mm -hmm. for all it's the temporary. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> where right now this generation just wants you to give them the stuff. Yeah. And if you're not just going to give it to them, they're going to walk in and just take it. Yeah. Yeah. All right, somebody else. I want to hear a few more. What do you think? I think the body, I feel God gave my body. And I, and when I accept it, yeah, he's in my He's in my yeah. He knows my thoughts. He knows what I need before I ask him. But he wants me to ask him. It's, it's such a wonderful feeling to feel that. Sometimes I just say, God, I'm thankful that you made me and that you know all about me because, you know, he, he, he just keeps you, keeps you going. We come back to the body several times. How many would say the body's on that one? That's, that's a hard one, okay? And, and the question was, what does it mean to sacrifice my body? Well, my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, that I'm going to treat my body as his temple, right? So I'm going to be careful what I put in it and what comes out. Well, that's my hardest. All right. Is that hard? Anybody here ever battle a diet? <laughs> you, think, you, know, you think God is concerned about our weight? You don't think he's I concerned about I think God was <laughs> There's got to be food in heaven because they say that you're going to come to the, the Well, you're going to gather at, the, at the, the table with God and you're going to celebrate. You can't celebrate yeah. the food. <laughs> <laughs> It cares about our health. Your health. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So he care. He cares about our body. Does he care about how uh, uh, immorality? Yeah. Oh yeah. So I'm supposed to protect my body from immorality. Okay. Uh, Job said an interesting thing in the book of Job. He said, "I made a covenant with my eyes that I would not look upon." I think uh, it says there. Uh, depending what translation, a lady. Uh, with, with, I, I did not look up with lust in my heart. So he, he made a covenant with his eyes that he wanted in his body to be pure. To be pure. Okay? Is sexual purity a heart problem in America today? Mm -hmm. uh, you <laughs> bet it is. Okay, you I'll bet. vouch for him. <laughs> You'll vouch for him? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, kind of along a different line. I think traditionally in, in our churches, I would say the hardest for, for a lot of people has been money because you try to talk about money in the church and you get people upset. Well, what does this say? It means they don't have a, a strong commitment because 
your your money goes where your commitment is. Yeah. And so there's a lot of people in church, it's like, hold on to my money because I'm not really committed to this thing. Yeah. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, well, I'm not going to beat this to death. I think we've covered that. Oh, that was your break time. You didn't <laughs> your discussion times are your break times, okay? So uh, we got a little... We've got a little bit more I want to cover. I want to do the second half of the Great Command. Now, I'm suggesting that to love the Lord your God with all your heart, okay, to love involves a sacrificial worship and service to God. All right? When it comes to loving your neighbor as yourself, okay, uh, I'm taking the Luke passage. Why would I love my neighbor as myself? Because I believe it is your sacrificial priestly service. Uh, you do this to serve the Lord. Every high priest, okay, I'm sure, I'm not talking about the high priest, but the high priests were taken from the priest, the priesthood, is selected from among men. The argument in the book of Hebrews is an angel could not serve as a priest. So it had to be a human being. And is appointed to represent them. I'm a believer priest. I am to represent people to God. That's the job of a priest. People would go to a priest, and the priest would take them to God. The prophet was just the opposite. God would speak to the prophet, and the prophet would speak to the people. So you got a two-way communication. The prophet gives a message to the people. The priest takes the people to God. That's why Jesus, in his high priestly prayer in, in uh, John 17, he is praying for the world and those that we wouldn't be of the world. He's praying for disciples that are yet to come. Because he's taking them to God, whereas a prophet brings a message of God to the people. And that's what's going on here. The priest represents people in matters related to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. Uh, he is able to deal gently with them because he knows those who are ignorant. You ever think of somebody being ignorant? I think you know, you're driving down the road and some guy just driving crazy out of that ignoramus, okay? The people are ignorant and they're going astray. And since he himself is subject to weakness, I'm subject to the same thing. Every now and then I'll say, oh man, that Christian, I think, oh, you cut off a guy last week. You, know, you were in a hurry last week, you see? And, and he says, so Jesus, no, he's, the whole idea is he's been tempted at every point like we are apart from us from sin. He knows what it is like that we're made of and all of that, and He takes us to God. It's our priestly service to take other people to the Lord. And because that is our priestly service, um, Jesus was asked on one occasion by an expert, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus, trying to test Him, and says, Teacher, he asked him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I preached from this past not long ago, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on it. He said, what was written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? And the guy answered, you're going to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus said, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Well, the whole point is you can't do all of that. You can try, but you don't ever really do that. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked, well, and who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? <coughs> and because Jesus said, you've got to love your neighbor. In reply, Jesus said, and you know the story. I'm just going to tell the story here, okay? A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell in the, into the hands of robbers and stripped him of his clothes and beat him and uh, went away, leaving him half dead. That expression, half dead, just intrigues me. Half dead? I don't know, maybe you heard the story about the guy that he was walking down the beach and he saw this bottle on the shore and he went over and picked it up and rubbed it to clean it off and all of a sudden a genie popped up. <laughs> You thought I'd tell a true story, didn't you? <laughs> and the genie says, I give you three wishes. And he said, oh, man. He said, I wish. And he said, but I'm, he said, wait a minute. Before you give you three wishes, he said, I'm going to give your worst enemy double of everything you get. He said, okay. I want a million dollars. And boom, there was a million dollars. You looked down the road, down the beach, and there's this guy that was his worst enemy. He had two million dollars. Oh, that really hurt him. He said, man, I said, I... I want a beautiful girl on my arm. Boom, all of a sudden she was there. Whoa. Whoa. He looks over, and the other guy's got one on each arm. <laughs> Finally, he says to the genie, I want you to beat me half to death. <laughs> <laughs> <Smart>. <laughs> 
<laughs> Saving a half dead. All right. <laughs> well, that's really this is an expression that says he was really worked over. You know, he, he he's in the throes of death. A priest happened to be going by the, down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. The priest, if he's going down the road, has just come from church. Okay, because he was up in Jerusalem. He's going to Jericho. Jericho, you go. You know, he's going down the road. He's leaving church. I mean, he's leaving his ministry in, the, in, in the, the, the temple. He's leaving. And he sees a guy. He's just come from church, but, you know, I don't know. Maybe he's got an appointment down at Albert's, or he's going over to the Greek Calipino, or he's going to the village inn. And he said, I don't have time to swerve over there and help this guy out. And so he passed by on the other side. So, too, a Levite. Now, a Levite, okay, a Levite was not a priest. But all priests were Levites. The Levites took care of all the things in the temple. So he'd be kind of like the deacons today, or, you know, the kind of, you know, he's a team member, he's been at church, you know, he's got, just got done cleaning up after serving the Lord's Supper, and he's got, he's in a hurry to get to the place where he's going for lunch too, and he comes to pass, the saint sees the guy on the side, and he passes by on the other side. But then a Samaritan, now the Samaritans you know were the most despised people to the Jews. They were half breeds, they were half. Gentile, and they were half Jewish, and they were Samaritans. I mean, it was like the lowest low you could be to a, a Jew, but the Samaritan, as he traveled, came to the place where the man was, he saw him, and he took pity on him. And he went, in, went to him, and he bandaged up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. He's taking care of the man. He put the man on his own donkey, and he took him to the inn and to take care of him. And he told the guy there, he said, hey, the next day he took up silver coins and he gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for extra expenses that you may have. And then Jesus asked. He doesn't give an answer. You notice Jesus was asked a question. He tells a story, and then he answers with a question. And here's the question. He's facilitating a man to discover the answer. Which of these three do you think was the neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of robbers. The final answer, the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Hang on to that word mercy. Because Jesus said, go to my place. Who's my neighbor? Anybody that comes across. Anyone that comes across. That's my neighbor. That's I have some discussion questions about this. <clears throat> the Good Samaritan is the story of how we love our neighbors. What part of the story intrigues you the most? You've heard this story probably all your life. People that aren't even Christians know this story. What part of the whole story intrigues you the most? Kind of that the guy was willing to just say, hey, I'm going to leave him here and take care of him, whatever he needs. I mean, he didn't even know what it was going to cost him. He didn't. Had no idea. But he gave his word that he would cover the guy. Cover it. Wow. I think it intrigues me. Who's trusting that he's going to be repaid. Yeah. The yeah. innkeeper believes this guy. <laughs> yeah. That's not very intriguing. Yes. I think it tricks me that anybody could just walk by. Oh. And then if, if you see anybody in need, you just, I mean, you do stop most of the time, I think. Or at least call today. You know, I've called the police on a guy that I thought was laying there dead up the side of the road. Yeah. He wasn't dead, but I mean, I, and I did, when you said, if you're in a hurry, yes, I was going, but I still called to check on him first. Somebody else, what intrigues you about the story? Well, I think what intrigues me is that the two that left him by the side of the road were considered the good guys yes. in, in the in society. The and, and they didn't have any compassion. Yeah. Uh, the thing is, I think sometimes we need to be aware, is this passage talking to me because you know, I think I'm this good guy but do I kind of get a little bit too 
I and myself and mm -hmm. overlooked some things? Yeah, in the greatest crisis in my life, I found the people I expected to be there were not. And the people I did not expect to be there, they surfaced. I, 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 I learned that. Well, the priest and the Levite, uh, I think probably going through their head, they both did a great job of rationalizing why they needed to be doing what they were doing rather than stopping and showing compassion and helping mm -hmm. this person. And I think as human beings, we all do a lot of that. Rationalize uh, ourselves out of doing something that in our deep down in our hearts we know we should be doing. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I, I, I feel a certain sense of guilt when I read this story or I hear this story. <laughs> yeah. That's my Catholic upbringing. <laughs> Sunday, you're going to go to hell. I mean, you, and you do. Any other thoughts? So, what yeah. intrigues you about the story? The, the priest and Levi knew that if they took care of this guy, they would have to be a, go through a cleansing process. Well, mm -hmm. Boy, that was well, that, that was, was their rationalization. Yeah. Not yeah, I know. I'm just yeah. expanding uh -huh. on your yeah. rationalization. So, it I'm rationalizing. Been. I'm in my good clothes. <laughs> I told you, I think I told you a story about the time I preached on this and then that Sunday, a Sunday morning at church and that Sunday evening I'm driving to church, I'm a little behind and I thought I was a little behind because there's a long line and so I whipped out, sped up, some of you read with me, you know I can do that really well, I sped up <laughs> oh, yeah. and then I cut over just in time to pull into the, the, trip, the, the car and I look, a guy is driving on his flat tire and that's why everybody's all backed up. I whipped in, parked my car. And I looked, and here comes this car with the flat tire. He pulled in right behind me. <laughs> he pulled in right next to me. He'd been driving on a flat tire. And so I got to preach here at evening service at the church. Got a few minutes, but I'm in nice, really clothes. I wore a suit for this. And so I get out, and uh, I said, well, can I help you? And he said, oh, yeah. I said, I got a flat. No kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, like now the wheel is shot, too. And so uh, I said, you got a jack? Oh, yeah, I got a jack. You got a spare? No, I don't have a spare. Mm -hmm. Oh, I said, well, we better go into church and find somebody to you know, give you a call. Just then my brother Dave comes whipping in and said, what's going on here? I said, well, this guy's got a flat. He doesn't have a spare. He looked at my car. He said, well, your car and his car are the same. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> give him your spare. Oh. I said, well, that's easy for my brother to say. <laughs> <laughs> so because I'm all dressed up, my brother jacks up the car and he does it all and he takes my spare and puts it on. <laughs> so the guy drives off, you know, and I never saw the guy ever again, okay? Oh, or your tire. Yep, and there went my tire, my, my donut tire, and I don't have no, I'm driving without a spare. <laughs> so the next day he calls me and said, don't worry. He worked at a body shop. He said, we got a junkyard, right? You know, I said, it's a GM, I got, I got. So that, he brought me, he brought me a donut. To, but, he was really pushing my butt. <laughs> and you gave up of your stuff. I, I prayed. Yeah. I, I preached. Exactly. And now it was time to put it into action. Right? And uh, there was a moment there I felt like this is going to really cost me because I'm now going to have to go get a spare tire. Right? And here my brother, he's enjoying every moment of this. Because he was in the back of the mind what he's going to do. And he's, he's watching the frustration and the struggle going on. And, and see, we, the rationalization is that what am I going to do if I don't have a spare? Right? And, and so I find myself like those priests and those Levites more than once, believe me, where I pass an opportunity and then it haunts me. I could have done something at the moment. And uh, it was very interesting. Jesus connected loving your neighbor with having mercy. You know, love your neighbor as yourself. Which one had which one uh, you know was a neighbor to the man? The one who had mercy. What does mercy mean to you? Compassion? Compassion? Yeah. Giving what you don't the person doesn't deserve necessarily. 
Yeah. When God is merciful to me, He withholds what I deserve. You ever see somebody say, well, they deserve that. They really got themselves in a fix, right? That's, that's judging. Mercy is saying, even though they deserved it, I'm going to overlook that. Grace is giving them what they don't deserve. They're cousins, mercy and grace. Okay, You give them what they don't deserve, that's grace. Withholding from them what they do deserve, that's mercy. And uh, there's many times when uh, uh, the loving thing, man, I could hold them to that, but I should be merciful. I mean, the judging thing, I should be merciful. Uh, they are connected. Three, how can we as individuals love our neighbors better? Give me some help here. How could I love my neighbor better? I think part of it maybe is a little bit connected to mercy now that I hear you say that, but I'm trying really hard when people act really crappy <laughs> to think, ooh, what's gone wrong in their life today to make them act that way and what might I do? Because I, you know, tend to want to react. And I'm, I'm saying, okay, there's a reason why they're doing that. That's good. I, I, that's great. Anybody else? I feel like I have to be less judgmental of them. Yeah. Because, well, you got yourself into that. It's your fault. It, you, we all make a certain amount of money, whether it's a lot or a little. Well, you just didn't use your money right or... You just didn't do things. I, I get yeah. judgmental. Yeah. All right. I looked at the clock. We're going on. <laughs> uh, what I have here, I want, I want to show you how important this is. i got a ton of verses here. Love the Lord your God, all right? That's what it's about. Love, love your neighbor as yourself. In the Old Testament, it is a law. It is a commandment. You know, we think of the Ten Commandments. There's actually 613 commandments in the Torah. I didn't count them. The Monides did like in the 13th century. 613 commandments. This is one of them. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. It's a law. All right. Second one. Gives us a reason to love your neighbor. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Then you may be the sons of your Father in heaven. Why? Here's the reason why. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. We call that common grace. God is shows grace to everyone. The fact that the sun comes up, not just on the just people, it comes up on the unjust. The fact that uh, my garden grows and my the, uh, the, the person who doesn't know the Lord's garden grows is because God is gracious to everyone. It's called common grace. Because he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what will what reward will you get? Are you not are not even the tax collectors doing that? No, the tax collectors were the scum of the earth in that day. I mean, that is as low as you could get. So you were embezzling from your own people. Okay. And he says, and if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that? Then here, this is the verse that just blows me away. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is pretty high standard, folks. That's why I know all have sinned. That's how, you know, I can't even fake it. My wife will tell you, yep, he's a sinner. <laughs> yeah. High standard. The reason I love everybody is because, look, at we've all, we've all fallen short. And... Uh, God is being, he's showing common grace to all of us. And he is, I can too, right? The next one is the supremacy of love your neighbor. The teacher, uh, the guy asked, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. It's the greatest commandment. The second is like to it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the other law, all the law and the prophets. Hang on these two commandments. Listen. If you will love your neighbor as yourself, you will fulfill the Ten Commandments. I won't lie to my neighbors. I won't covet his wife. Uh, I, I won't murder him. 
I, I, just, I just won't do it because I, I love my neighbor as I love myself. I wouldn't want any of that done to me. Every commandment is filled, fulfilled, okay, when I love the Lord with all my heart love my neighbor as myself. That's why I don't try to keep the Ten Commandments. I just try to love God and love my neighbor. Because if I do that, I will fulfill all those commands just naturally. The next one, I don't know if this is a word or not. Betterness? I don't know if it's a word or not. Not bitterness. The betterness in loving your neighbor. Uh, one of the creatures of the law asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Well, the most important one, Jesus answered, is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is uh, <clears throat> the Lord is one. That's from the Shema, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Uh, he says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these two. Well said, the teacher, uh, teacher, the man replied. You were right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. Then he says, to love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and, all, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. Isn't that interesting? I don't know why. It's very simple. Burnt offerings were corrective for a wrong done. You see, if I wrong someone, now I have obligation to make a sacrifice to cover the, the wrong that I have done and make retribution to the person. But if I love that person, it's preventative. If I love that person, I won't wrong him from the get-go. So I won't need a burnt offering or a sacrifice. You see what's going on there? If I love, it, it's more important than sacrifices. Loving my neighbor as myself. We already covered this one on the mercy in Luke chapter 10, verse 25. We read that earlier. I like this one. Love your neighbor here, it says in the, in, in the book of Romans, chapter 13. <clears throat> the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever other commandment there may be, there's like 613, <laughs> are summed up in this one rule. I put here the 10 equals 1. The 10 commandments are summed up in one. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's why Christianity is, we're a love religion. We're not a law keepers. We're, we're, we believe <coughs> that if I love my neighbor, I'm going to fulfill the law without even trying to keep the Ten Commandments. The entire law is summed up in a single commandment, love your neighbor as yourself, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 14. <coughs> the righteousness of, the, the, uh, of love your neighbor. If you really keep the royal law found in the scriptures, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. It's the righteous thing to do. It's righteous. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as a lawbreaker. Oh my goodness. If I don't love, then I'm a lawbreaker. So how do we do this? How do we do this? As a church, through the book of Romans 15, it says, Now, however, I am on my way to Jerusalem in the service of the saints there. For Macedonia and Achaia were pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. A family was in Jerusalem, the, the, the sending church of the Apostle Paul, you know, uh, of the missionaries. We'll see that next week. We find that uh, the churches he went out and started, they were taking up an offering for the mother church. Isn't that cool? And... and and he says, they were pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. I want to show you some examples of what we do. We do this very thing as a church. Open door. Open door. We do that. We, we, through our open, you know, do, being a part of open door, we are actually loving our neighbors mm -hmm. as ourselves. There's another way we do that. Blessings in a backpack. I mean, we're helping the poor, these poor kids that aren't getting meal. We're helping them, okay? Another way, Grace Centers of Hope, when we reach out to people who are in great need. One hour of sharing that we do once a year, you know, our offering last year has gone to the hurricane victims this year, all right? And we're going to do another one here coming up. I think it's in November. I don't know. October. We're on world mission. Yeah, we're, 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 then we're, it's next month. We're, when we give to that, Okay, that, that, that offering, whenever there's a crisis and a need, the Baptists are there, the American Baptist Churches of America, we're there to help the people at a time of crisis and need. Okay, and that's, that's how we do that as a church. 
How do we do this as individuals? As individuals. Jesus said, Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Surely I say to you, they have their reward already. Uh, there were in the, I think it was the Solomon Esplanade there in the temple, there were these big trumpets is what they were called. They looked like a trumpet, you know, and big, and then it went down into, you ever been in a mall, you see where you put the coin yeah. in it, and you drop it, and you go, yeah. all right? That's what they were like, but they were made out of metal. So when you throw your money in, it would make a lot of noise. And so when they were giving their charitable contributions, you know, it's like our noisy offering, we do that, you know, to help the, you know, for the kids, say. But they were doing it, the more you could throw in, look what I gave. You know, look what I gave. And he's saying, no, 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 when you do this, don't let anybody know what you're giving. Pass it forward is all about this. Pass it forward is all about this. You know, uh, we were hoping that uh, our congregation would gravitate to this and say, you know what, I am going to be the good good Samaritan. I'm going to pass it forward, and, and I'm going to write on that an anonymous note of how I passed it forward to encourage other people to pass it forward too. And so we got that receptacle out there that people could just write how they passed it forward, throw it in there. And then when we, on Sunday, I'm trying to pull those out and read them, but they're all gone. Because there had not been that many put in there. We, individually, this is what we're doing. We're trying to pass it forward. It says here in Matthew 6, But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your Father who is in heaven is secret, will himself reward you openly. That's why we want them anonymous. Because we don't want to take your reward <laughs> just to promote it on Sunday. We want you to do this and encourage others to do this. All right? It's interesting, at Joppa, on the missionary journey, they came across the gal. There was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. She had the reputation of being someone who did good deeds. Alright. Well, yeah, I'm gonna <clears throat> the last one is there are things that we love my neighbor, and that's like the guy sitting in the pew next to me in church, okay? Um, in the church. Because the Bible says we're, there are things that we should do to one another. I've got thirty two different things that the Bible tells us. These are all commands, they're imperatives that we as a church do this to one another. Now I'm not going to go down through this whole list, but I just want you to, I'm going to read them, but we're not going to discuss everyone. Love one another, be at peace with one another, devote, be devoted to one another, honor one another, be in harmony with one another, stop judging one another, edify or build up one another, accept one another, instruct one another, greet one another with a holy kiss. I could question some of your kisses if you try that. <laughs> In our culture, it's a good handshake, right? Yeah, yeah. You greet people. You greet one another with a holy kiss. Uh, agree with one another. Wait for one another. Be concerned for one another. Serve one another. Carry one another's burdens. Be kind to one another. Be compassionate with one another. Bear one another's burdens. Forgive one another. Submit to one another. Be considerate of one another. Admonish one another. Speak truthfully to one another. Encourage one another. Spur on one another. Do, do not slander one another. Yeah, that's like no gossip. All right? uh, not to grumble with one another. Confess your sins to one another. That's a little close to home. Pray for one another. Offer hospitality to one another. Be humble before one another. Fellowship with one another. There's 32 of them. I just went right through the whole list. Those are the ones I found in my New Testament, okay? Uh, what you do to one another. I, I love my neighbor as myself. i got a few discussion questions here to wrap this up. From the list of the verses, and I put the references on your sheets for all of those. Love your neighbor. The verses on love your neighbor, okay? That was the first part of this. I went through all those verses. It would appear that this is a primary concern of God. How concerned are you 
and what do you do that is evidence of your concern? Whoa, that's a loaded question. How concerned? I know what my answer would be. Not concerned enough. What do you think? I'm really far more preoccupied with myself. I shouldn't be. But I am. I just being blunt honest here. I'm not nearly as concerned as I should be. And I'm trying to be more concerned. <laughs> but there's always room for improvement in that uh, in our lives. Well, I think this is the last one I have is when you peruse that list of 32 commands of one another, which of the 32 is the easiest and which is the most difficult for you to do? Very quick peek at that. This could be different for all of us. It could be a different set. Which is the easiest, which is the most difficult for you to do? Any volunteers to say which one they are? Agree with. Is that the easiest or difficult? That's the hardest. All right. <laughs> what do you have? Well, I agree with you with confessing our sins to one another. That is, again, that hits close to home. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, yeah, that, that, that can be difficult. That can be difficult to put something out there because you make yourself very vulnerable. Yeah. And admonishing, I think, is, is difficult, too, because you feel like you're being, you, you might come across as being judgmental. Judgmental. And, and playing God. Yeah. So, yes. And it also opens me up, you know, for, for you know. Coming back. For with, coming back at Yeah. Me, right? I'm going to take the, the plank out of there. Right. The speck out of their eye, they're going to pull the plank out of right. mine. Exactly. <laughs> Lottie, you had your hand up? I didn't, I wasn't sure if I heard it. What, did they mention confession? No, yeah. that one was not mentioned. No, that, that's hard for me. But that goes along the same, confessing your sense of yeah. 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 I like the peace uh, in neighborhoods with our neighbors. Very important. God, not when the bad of peace, uh, peacemakers, we got to get children. Yes, blessed are the peacemakers. Sometimes peace. you can, you know, maybe the neighbor on each side or something was that you can try. Mm -hmm. And ask God to help you. Let me get some. One of the neighbor's cats is in your yard. That's good. <laughs> I said, like, well, you know, they suggest maybe I call someone to come and take it away. I said, well, I'd rather talk to my neighbor and just talk to them about it. You know, I, I would want to. Oh, that's awesome. And now the other neighbor loves likes that cat, that cat. <laughs> he sleeps on our Good deck. Good solution, yeah. He sleeps on our deck, and I, I like to watch him in the morning while we're eating breakfast. <laughs> I don't feed him because it is in the other neighbor's cat. <laughs> Somebody else, what do you have on the Carry list? burdens would be the hardest for What's me. What's that one? Carry burdens of others. Carry other people's burdens? Yeah. Okay. That'd be hard for me. What do you got? Not to grumble with. Mm -hmm. um, not to grumble with one another? <laughs> yeah, that was my other one. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure this is the easiest, but there are the ones that I really uh, like are to pray for, number 29, and 30, offer hospitality to. Yes. Hospitality to. Hospitality to. <laughs> All right. Somebody else? All right, I'm two minutes over. I hope you don't uh, punish me for that. Next week, we're going to talk about the Great Commission. Uh, I'm excited about this one. And this is going to be fun. And I, I, we'll have a little interaction with this. And then uh, this, this wraps up the series. The following week, we're going to have um, a concert of prayer. Okay. And if you were at the last one, it's pretty exciting. We can spend an evening just praying all sorts of prayers, all different ways. Uh, but we're going to do Jesus built prayers that night. We're going to do Jesus built prayers based on what we've been doing here. And, uh, and that's also based upon what we're going to do next week. Um, so that there's, there's going to be a link between the two. Then uh, in February, we're going to cover these same three things the, the great uh, confession, and uh, we're going to do a study of the life of Christ. Okay. We're going to learn more about the life of Christ. And then the. <clears throat> We're going to look at the Sermon on the Mount for the Great Commandment. Okay, we're going to just survey the whole Sermon on the Mount. And then uh, 
the great conf uh, the great commission next time we're going to uh, survey the, the the missionary journeys of the apostle paul in the book of acts it, it's like uh, an action-packed movie or you know the script for one it's just it's, it's awesome the, the book of acts i just i love going through the book of acts uh, but that's what we have planned i'm going to close with prayer and thank you for coming father in heaven uh, we're so very thankful that we have the Word of God. We are believer priests. We come right into your presence. We, we can come to the throne of grace at any time. Uh, somehow when we uh, close out the world, just pray, we come right into your very presence and you hear us. And the Lord, we expect you that, that you will answer us as we trust and believe in you. We're asking for you to build your church here, Bethany. Uh, Lord, we ask that you would bring new people to us. And that we would be that kind of people that loves our neighbor as ourself. And it would be seen among us and people's lives would be changed because of it. Uh, we pray, Father, when we come to worship and love the Lord our God with all our heart, we come with a sacrifice. Praise on our lips, an offering to bring and put in the offering plate. And we pray, Father, that most of all we would come here to dedicate ourselves afresh to you. To hear you speak to us through your word. Lord, we just pray that you'll, you'll make all the things we've been covered here this evening a reality in our church. And for we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.